I met Jerry in 1967 at a party given by Stuart Montgomery, who was then running uh, Fulcrum Press. And um, he gave a party to, to launch uh, Jerry's book, Between, that he'd published. And some months before, I'd just finished a small folio of about five or six prints with Zen texts, classic uh, Zen aphorisms, which you can find in uh, translations everywhere. And um, I took one of these along as a sort of present offering for Jerry. And uh, he, he seemed to like this very much. And he asked me if I was going to continue to do this sort of thing. Because this was really the first time I put words and images together in a really coherent way. Almost immediately we hit it off, almost immediately uh, Ian expressed an interest in, uh, in doing visual versions uh, of poems that I had been writing at that time called Sightings, uh, the most minimal work uh, that I had done uh, up to that point. He sent me the text of Sightings and they were indeed perfect for what I wanted to do. They had this, uh, they were cut into sections, they had a staccato feel to them, and they were very brief and certainly enigmatic. So I said, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll do it. Uh, in the uh, sightings, there were uh, <coughs> short fragmented uh, elements uh, separated by small dots or bullets that, uh, that represented long, uh, well, a, a variation of, uh, of silences. Uh, between the, uh, the fragments. Sightings 1. He hides his heart. A precious arrangement of glass and flowers. They have made a covenant between them, the circumstance of being tried. Who will signal you? It doesn't open to their touch, though some wait where it rests. Try sleep. The emblem, perhaps, of a herd of elephants, a signal for a change in weather. Animal. A pigeon dreaming of red flowers. Um, and then he added a poem, Red Easier Color, uh, to make it a, really a first edition of that poem. The others had been published by him in Hawkeswell Press before that. So we started and I looked at the text very carefully and there were nine poems and there are approximately nine sections in each poem. So I devised a grid which was uh, basically uh, three by three rectangles, squares actually, uh, divided up into much smaller squares. Ian came up with a, uh, a series of relatively, uh, rather dense works uh, uh, with multiple colors, uh, but all following the, uh, uh, the grid pattern which he, which he was then, uh, then working. And I then took extracts from the lines. I used certain words or phrases as a starting point for a symbol. Having done this and placed them in these nine squares, I realized that um, there was a certain literary quality about this, which, which was, um, to me, not quite what I wanted. So at that point, I abandoned this idea and simply let the, the images tell me what to do in a much more random way. They, they floated much freer after that. What the images did was to uh, focus on the, uh, on the structural possibilities with which I was working uh, in, in the poems uh, and without having to pay uh, any great regard 
uh, to the uh, uh, to the themes or the uh, or the meanings in the uh, in the poems. You have the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine squares, and they're basically in these black and white divisions, and then the color is added. Uh, so he read the structure, I thought, very well, uh, and um, uh, prized him uh, from that moment on as uh, an, an excellent interpreter of the, uh, of the work, uh, and thought uh, that it was really uh, marvelous to have the work accompanied by that kind of uh, image, uh, which doesn't impose meaning on top of meaning in the, uh, uh, in the ordinary sense. What I asked the printers to do was to run off, um, I can't remember, maybe 20 or 30 copies, of just the black and white grid with no color at all, which they did. And I took those home. And then uh, with crayons, I filled them in with different colors until I got something that I wanted. It was the first big book that I'd ever done. It was really quite ambitious. We had certain problems printing the text, which was done letterpress and by a firm in Guildford. And it was a union shop. And in the text, you have the word fucking, used in its absolutely direct context out of the Oxford, <laughs> Oxford English Dictionary. And he said, I can't get my printers to set this. Uh, so he, this is the person who ran the, the, the business. So he went in on Sunday and set it himself, but scrambled. And they accepted that. And then before they ran it on the press, he came down and reset it. I mean, it's a piece of absolute nonsense, but it, it was just one of those, you know, it's those anecdotes that follow these things. So we, we ended up with a book which I still like. And that's not always the case. But I, the more I look at it, the more I think that it was really one of the uh, seminal pieces that I did. It set me off on some other, other things, you know. Uh, but like music, it's just a different way of, uh, of reading the work. So that ended one phase, and then I immediately started uh, on offering flowers, which... Uh, Apart from the image, is probably the most bizarre thing that I've ever done technically. Because I set the text um, using something called letter set, which um, I'm not sure even exists anymore, but they were plastic letters, as I'm sure you all remember. The plastic letters that you rub down onto the page. So this whole thing was done like that and used up about four complete sheets of letter set. And there's quite a lot on a sheet of this size. And I never used it again. Uh, ancient Aztec uh, texts uh, that had been uh, uh, translated by others uh, into, uh, uh, into English uh, that were a part of these uh, series of, uh, of definitions uh, of the ordinary things of, uh, of the Aztec world, uh, in this case, flowers. These are um, Aztec symbols or derivatives of Aztec symbols and flowers and architecture, all sorts of things like that. that all those references creep in there. So there's still um, that kind of literary reference or representation, if you like, image. There. Um, and of course, as we went on, that was gradually dis disappeared out of my work completely. Uh, the piece began with a short description of uh, uh, the use of flowers in, uh, in Aztec ceremonies, again taken from the old manuscripts, uh, and then a uh, series of uh, uh, mostly short sentences uh, in which the word uh, flower is repeated over and over again, uh, and in which the uh, the person defining the word is defining it by giving uh, you know, all of the possible examples of how that word might be used uh, in the native language. Offering flowers. The Aztecs had a feast which fell out on the ninth month and which they called... The flowers are offered. 
And two days before the feast, when flowers were sought, all scattered over the mountains, that every flower might be found. And when these were gathered, when they had come to the flowers and arrived where they were, at dawn they strung them together. Everyone strung them. And when the flowers had been threaded, then these were twisted and wound in garlands, long ones, very long and thick, very thick. Before him they spread, strewed and hung rows of all the various flowers, the most beautiful flowers and threaded flowers. And when midday came, they all sang and danced quietly, calmly, evenly they danced. They kept going as they danced. They all sang and danced quietly, calmly, evenly they danced. They kept going as they danced. I offer flowers, I sow flower seeds, I plant flowers, I assemble flowers, I pick flowers, I pick different flowers, I remove flowers, I seek flowers, I offer flowers, I arrange flowers, I thread a flower, I string flowers, I make flowers, I form them to the extending uneven round and round bouquets of flowers. I make a flower necklace, a flower garland, a paper of flowers, a bouquet, a flower shield, hand flowers. I thread them, I string them, I provide them with grass, I provide them with leaves. I make a pendant of them. I smell something. I smell them. I offer flowers to one. I offer him flowers. I provide him with flowers. I provide one with flowers. I provide one with a flower necklace. I provide him with a flower necklace. I place a garland on one. I provide him a garland. I clothe one in flowers. I clothe him in flowers. I destroy one with flowers. I destroy him with flowers. I injure one with flowers. I injure him with flowers. I destroy one with flowers. I destroy him with flowers. I destroy one with flowers. I I destroy him with flowers. I injure one with flowers. I injure him with flowers. I destroy one with flowers. I incite him with flowers, with words. I beguile him. I say, I caress him with flowers. I seduce one. I extend one a lengthy discourse. I induce him with words. I provide one with flowers. I make flowers. Or I give them to one that someone will observe a feast day. Or I merely continue to give one flowers. I continue to place them in one's hand. Or I provide one with a necklace or I provide one with a garland of flowers. The, the text has a certain rhythm, and it came into two parts. So I used the F to divide the text into two parts. I thought, well, it's really quite interesting if you use a leading letter, as in an illuminated manuscript, and try and do it in a different way, in, in a way that uh, relates to, to the image, the way the image is made. So that's why this, you have this enormous F here and the small O there, and then the rest of offering on that line. And then you continue to get this pulse in the second half. Uh, for this, uh, Ian uh, created a uh, fantasy of colors uh, that may even, in, in a way, uh, have been uh, a, a visual, uh, you know, but hard-edged uh, representation of flowers. Uh, and the whole was printed as a broadsheet uh, uh, with the words on one side, uh, you know, and these uh, brilliant uh, uh, orange and black and white uh, colors on the, uh, on the facing pages. I thought of it as probably uh, uh, the, the most romantic work uh, that, uh, that Ian had uh, ever gotten into. Uh, I was also at that time uh, working with uh, uh, American Indian poetry uh, towards uh, the publication of large assemblages or anthologies uh, like Technicians of the Sacred and, uh, and Shaking the Pumpkin. Uh, and uh, 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 Ian came into that picture as well. The question was, uh, you know, I had interpreted Indian material in a certain way, uh, and uh, how would Ian supplement that uh, by uh, visual, accompanying visual uh, in, in interpretations uh, that, again, were not uh, literal uh, uh, Indian uh, uh, images? Uh, I think the first work that we uh, did using Indian material uh, was uh, the, the 17 Horse Songs, uh, which I had translated, uh, uh, again, not, not simply for their content, uh, but uh, trying to uh, uh, bring over into uh, uh, English 
uh, the, uh, the, uh, the relationships between words and, uh, and other sounds and, uh, and, and music uh, that, uh, in my mind, uh, gave them a, uh, a certain relationship to uh, experimental sound poetry in our own time. The first time that I had come across anybody trying to put something which had nonsensical sounds in it into English, uh, using nonsensical sounds in English as well. So that fascinated me in terms of, of trying to get it right on the page without disturbing the way he'd set it out. I couldn't, you know, I've never felt that I have any right whatsoever to change what the poet wants. Mm -mm -mm Summer lovely now buds on her and dart my hose now one one by wing summer lovely now buds on her and dart my hose now one my wing but now Jerry had these four horse songs, which were divided into, into the two colours, blue and white, and were about the, the, the Navajo going uh, to, to look for the spirit horses and bringing them back. And the text, which we discussed again, you know, considerably at length in New York, was that it, a total abstraction. It was, in a way, it was nothing to do with the Navajo. In another way, it was totally to do with the Navajo. Uh, Ian took the texts that I had created, uh, backed off, uh, and presented a, uh, a simplified uh, image. Uh, the uh, colors uh, blue and white uh, dominating the pattern abstract, uh, perhaps with some uh, resemblance to, uh, uh, to Navajo weaving, uh, but maintaining that uh, uh, squared off and hard edge quality uh, that represented the kind of visual work uh, which was the uh, center of his interest and of his intensity. The feeling was of some of the going through, you know, going up into the sky to bring back these horses. And that's what I, I made. These images are to do really with the possibility of going through something. And uh, in a sense, I'm using a 20th century constructivist idiom, but then that's where I come from. So that's, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's okay. Um, but at the same time, they relate to uh, perhaps Navajo sand paintings or blankets or whatever. You know, there's, there's, there's a considerable amount of abstraction in Navajo imagery anyway. Uh, the Gematria poems, those based on uh, traditional Hebrew numerology and uh, uh, the, uh, the mysticism of, uh, of numbers, uh, were a work uh, that I was focused on uh, in the 1980s, early 1990s. Uh, and the poems, particularly the, uh, uh, the shorter ones, uh, it seemed to me like the earlier sightings uh, uh, were very much in, uh, in line with the, uh, 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 the kind of work that, uh, that Ian was doing. Sometime in the early 60s, using computer, somebody translated the first five books of the Old Testament, which comprised the Torah, into all their numerical values. So it's like a compendium of words from these first five books of the words in numbers. Um, the idea of gematria intrigues me because if you consider that a, you can translate anything, any text, into numbers, you can also say, and you can say, that any word that has a numerical value 
can be the same word or an alternative for any other word that has the same numerical value. In terms of control, language control, you must be onto a winner. Because you can say, that's the text, you read that. But it's not the real text. If you translate it into numbers, and then you retranslate the numbers, you will find there's a hidden text. It's a completely different text. But you don't know the correspondences and you don't know the values. But don't worry about it, because I do. So I will just tell you what everything says. It's a very good control system and emerged from the Kabbalah. Over a number of years, uh, there were some publications between us uh, that used uh, uh, selections of, uh, of gematria uh, for texts and uh, uh, were accompanied by his, uh, his visual interpretations. In previous uh, works, uh, he has come up with a text. He has proposed a text and I have then worked on it and we've come to some sort of arrangement about this. In this instant, I proposed six colours and using Gematria texts, asked him to write texts that were appropriate to each of the colors. I looked through the, the hundreds of short Gematria poems uh, that I had composed uh, and uh, found uh, examples in which uh, the uh, primary and secondary colors uh, uh, turn up. Uh, and so for my part, uh, you know, these were the uh, 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 the six selections, three primary, three secondary colors. Uh, and uh, uh, Ian followed suit. The, uh, uh, structurally, uh, all of his visualizations uh, <coughs> follow the same uh, linear pattern. Uh, and uh, uh, the variation is uh, from uh, color to, uh, to color. Uh, so the, uh, the blue, uh, which is broken into actually three short poems, uh, in blue one, her breasts were done. In blue two, her breasts for you. In blue three, for thee, for thee. And the color uh, to the left of the poems uh, is, uh, uh, is blue. The images themselves are made up of uh, 26 lozenges of color inside a dark gray frame. And the 26 lozenges stand for the letters of the, our present alphabet. I was interested or <laughs> taken by, uh, uh, you know, the strong sense of structure in, uh, in Ian's work in relation to what I uh, was doing, at least for some considerable part of my own work, uh, <clears throat> because it, it, in effect, emphasized uh, the structure and the process uh, that were also important to me, but were in a sense obscured, because I was also given to um, to meaning, uh, you know, and to uh, the use of uh, of words uh, with their own semantic particularities. So the, the words uh, the words meant something. They were uh, real words. I'm always been interested in these cross references. You know, I don't believe art comes from from one place, it comes from all over the place. So um, I'm as much influenced as by, by a cycladic a piece of cycladic sculpture or very, very early Indian or Chinese art as I am by something that's done by us with Kelly, it, it, you know, or anybody else working now. So I don't see these, I don't have these problems of where something fits in. Um, it, my personal idiom is to use uh, non-objective imagery, and that's what I do. I was much more comfortable with, uh, you know, with Ian's interpretation of the um, uh, the poems and songs uh, as abstract compositions, uh, you know, than I would have been with uh, with highly uh, illustrative uh, uh, works. Uh, his um, images, both like the work of a good medical practitioner, did no harm.
uh, you know, and tended to uh, to heighten and uh, and bring out elements in my own work, uh, you know, that might otherwise not have been so evident.